This is Larry Morrissey, and today is August 18th, 2016, and I'm at Wells Church. I'm with James Mason, a longtime member here, and uh, we're here to kind of talk about your journey uh, coming to Wells and your life as a worshiper here at Wells over the past uh, decades. And this is for the Wells Oral History Project. Um, how I start these interviews off is just to have the person talk a little bit about their background, where they were born and where they grew up, and if you were raised in a religious tradition a little bit about you know what tradition that was and maybe a little about your kind of your family life around related around religion right yeah well i was born in laurel mississippi um my my uncle who's a family doctor uh, jimmy waits actually delivered me there uh grew up all my formative years were in tupelo mississippi and my faith tradition there was um as a southern baptist I, my family, we were um, longtime members at Harrisburg Baptist Church, and um, my mom attended there until she died four years ago. My father still lives there and attends. You know, after I left Tupelo, I went to college at, at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, and sort of began a little bit of a ecumenical journey. I, I continued in the Southern Baptist Church throughout my college years, but once I graduated, I went into the Army and so was stationed at a number of different posts and, and installations and uh, went to uh, Evangelical Free Church, went to the non-denominational uh, post chapels at times. But probably the, the, the signature uh, journey, I think, in a, my church experience was at my last duty station in San Antonio, Texas, where I went to uh, Madison Square Presbyterian Church. It was a PCUSA church and an incredible, wonderful place. And as I was getting ready to leave the Army and come back to Jackson, uh, and I knew I wanted to move here specifically, and I knew I wanted to teach school, and I got involved in education. But I worried when I left San Antonio, I said, well, I'm never going to find a church as neat as Madison Square. There's, um, I just, I, I was really concerned about that. But, you know, um, you can call it fate or whatever. People use different labels to describe a lot of life experiences, but I moved back here and um, met a, a dear friend who's uh, Lucy Hansford, and um, we had met through a mutual friend, and she she had been looking around at different churches, and, and so we started visiting some different different ones around town, and then one day she said, "Why don't we go to Wells Church?" You know, I, I hadn't been there in years and years, and people have uh, always said wonderful things about it and Keith Tonkle, why don't we go there? And so I said, oh, great, let's, we'll go there. And um, as it turns out, it was the, the Sunday that we went was the Sunday after Wells Fest. And, um, and it was just an incredible feeling of once I got here, it, it was this overwhelming sense of this is it. This is, this is a place. And uh, just a lot of, a lot of memories of, um, past churches and wonderful experiences and I didn't all the things that have kept me at Wells over the last 24 years um, I didn't know any of those that first Sunday obviously but I just knew there was something special about this place and after that Sunday I stopped looking because I knew that this was this is where I wanted to to you know sink in and to to put down some some roots and and begin a new a new part of my, my faith journey, and it's, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful time for me here. What do you remember about that first time, like about the service or the people that you met, any kind of things that stick out in your memory specifically? You know, I don't really, I don't remember a lot of specifics about the service. I, I remember this sense of this place is different. Like I said, over the previous 10 years, um, I had lived in lots of places and gone to tons of different churches, but I just knew there was something different here about it. Um, some of it you, maybe was just the, the, uh, the sense of the people. I mean, just when you, you looked around, it looked different because it was so diverse. And, and that's one of the things that uh, often people talk about in terms of wells is diversity, but it's, it's diversity in lots of different ways. Cause usually when you say diversity, you think immediately to race 
and say, well, well, so it must have been integrated or you had blacks and whites. Well, and, and, and yes, because obviously that is still not a, not a normal thing in, in, a, in, in sadly a lot of churches. But, but there, was, there was that, but you also noticed, and, and I was trying to, do, you know, I'm often asked to try to describe wells and what's it like and who, what are the people like. And I used to throw out all these labels. Well, you'll see this here, you'll see this here. And I've stopped doing that because so many people here just defy labels. But, but, but whether it's racially, whether it's socioeconomically, whether it's, um, you know, political orientation, sexual orientation, I mean, it's a, it's a real kaleidoscope here. And, you know, Keith, he often uses a, the phrase here, that when he gets to heaven, he said, I don't know what it's going to be like or what the people are going to look like, but he said, I suspect it's going to look a lot like this. And, um, and, I, and I, I do believe that. I think that there's a, a place here and a inclusiveness that is, is rare and that really draws people here in a in a in a deep way. So what? So you decided this is the place. So you immediately did you start coming every Sunday after that, or how did you kind of go from just being a visitor to being a member? Yeah, it's it's again people's journeys take take lots of different turns. I mean, for me, because um, my normal practice is to to attend church. And so I started attending regularly on each Sunday. Um, and, you know, I guess the thing, you know, one of the, one of the stories and I, and I, that, that sticks out and, and maybe this will give you a person to talk. I don't know if you've talked to Lucy Hansford. Uh, she was a good friend of mine and, um, and, and she's got a great story that she, that she has shared. And I, I hesitate to share it because it's her story, but I, but but she'll do it. She'll do it better, and hopefully you'll have a chance to talk with her. But it was these experiences of hearing all these different people's stories that that kept me coming back. You know, one of the things that she talked about was um, she's a school teacher, and she was just talking to her kids in in class one day, and so. I forget how the story came up, but there was a, a little boy in her class who was, I think he was new to the school. And, and so it came up about church and where do you go and all, and somehow. And he said, well, we don't, we don't go to church. And it was sort of a, a sadness, I think, the way she described it. And she said, well, why not? He, because she, it was like he wanted to. And then another little boy said, well, he said, well, we're not really accepted. And she said, well, why? And another little child started pointing at his skin. And this child was mixed race. And so his mother was white, his father was African American, and they had had some bad church experiences uh, where they were not embraced and they were not welcomed. And uh, and Lucy said, it's sort of tough to talk about because it, it is. But she said, I think you can come to my church, and I bet they would like you and welcome you. And so he went home and he told his mom, and they came. And 24 years later, they're still here. And his mom was downstairs organizing the food for the funeral that we just had today. And and it's one story, and it's one child, and it's one family, but there are, I literally suspect, countless hundreds I don't know maybe probably thousands over the years of Keith's ministry where people come to this place for lots of different reasons and they find an acceptance and they find an embrace and they find a comfort that is often unique and again we have a lot of people here who um, one of the tough things about wells is that people come and go all the time there are people in their faith journey i think who need um, a refuge and they need a place for healing and then they can go back 
And so a lot of times we have some wonderful dear people that come with us for a period of time and they're uh, and they find what they need and whatever that means for different people in their journey. And they're able to continue in a different place. And and I think that's a, a real gift that this that this congregation and this community offers. And so um when you come here on a given Sunday, it's, it's, it's almost an awkwardness about um, talking and introducing because you, you're not sure if they've been here for a long time or they've been here for a short time or have I just not seen them because, because you want to make everybody welcome. And so that, that's one of the things that has, has kept me coming back is to see how this place can meet people where they are can embrace them, provide a space. If you want to get involved, great. If you want to do things, great. If you want to have anonymity and sit at the back of the church and slip out quietly at the end of the service, that's okay too. Um, you, know, you said, what are some of the things that did stand out at the service? You know, one of one of our traditions here is that we will sing. Um, We'll celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, and you call them out in the service, and we'll sing happy birthday to you. But early on, I realized that um, one of the other elements of that is not just um, our normal birthdays, but a lot of people will celebrate their sobriety birthdays. And so when you have an individual who stands up and says, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be celebrating 10 years of sobriety, and then to see a congregation, you know, clap and hug and embrace. I mean, it's a safe place. It's a safe place here. And I think that that was really, really unique for a period of time. Um, one of the great things that I've seen happening, I believe, in, in Christianity and in the church is um, more of an openness to those types of encounters and those types of discussions. So, um, you know, who knows how much of it, that influence came out of Wells or if, if it's just where it, where it comes from. But um, I'm glad and encouraged to see more of what we have here and more of the, the love and the grace, I think, reflected in, in other places. Everyone else is just catching up with Wells. Maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe we're the, the, the trendsetter. There was a book years ago written that said, you make the road by walking. And I think that, that a lot of people, a lot of people's journey has walked through Wells and, and with Wells. And then when they go back, I mean, you, you cannot experience this church and, and this community, I don't believe, and leave unchanged. It's one of those things, once, once you've experienced the, a different way, then wherever you are, that's going to influence who you are, how you worship, how you live, and how, you, know, how you raise your children. And, um, and so, like I say, there, whether it, whatever the source, and I mean, obviously, I think, obviously the source, I think, comes from people's faith journey and, um, and how Christ has impacted their life. And, but I think we just, we keep getting better understandings or clear understandings of that. We talk about kind of your, your transformation from being just kind of a first time visitor to being an active participant within the, within the church. Yeah, because it was a number of years, and I think a lot of people um, at Wells come and they'll test the waters and sort of sit. And, and so I was the, um, I would come and I'd go to church, go to Sunday school, but still sort of sitting back um, and, and viewing from the, from the outside a little bit. Um, but I guess in anything in life that you think is important, whether it's family, faith, vocation, whatever, I think you sort of reach a point where 
you're you're either going to be in the game or you're just going to sit in the bleachers. And, you know, for me, it was this is an important place. And this community of faith is, is engaged in important work. And I want to be more of a part of that. Um, you know, when I moved back to Mississippi in 1992, I mean, I, frankly, I didn't I didn't think I'd come back to Mississippi after I left for college and went in the Army. Um, I really didn't, but but the realization sort of hit me as well. You're you're part of the problem, or you're part of the solution, and so so I I tried to come back and, and become part of that solution set, um, working for for many years in in public education, and and through the work here at Wells. But but I guess it was just a a desire to um, to help sustain this group, and and then you know as I I grew got married, had kids, and I want this to be a, a viable um, church for, for many years that, um, that my kids can be a part of if they, you know, continue to choose this as, as, their, as their church home. But, but I just think there's so much to offer here. And despite the fact that many people are sort of, quote, catching up with a lot of the things that, that we do here, it's still unique in a lot of ways. So you went from, so, so talk a little bit about like, what did you first kind of get kind of, did somebody rope you in to say, come, come help us with this? Or did you hold your hand up at some point or did Keith uh, collar you on something? Or? No, you know, interestingly, the, um, the, the first, uh, when I stuck my toe in the water, there was a ministry that we used to do years ago that was done for many years by Keith Ferguson and it was started by him, and it involved getting a group of people to go out to some nursing homes and play dominoes with residents one night a week. And so I don't even remember what night it was, but um, but we would go out to some of the um, retirement homes and just play dominoes. And and I think it sort of speaks to what we talk about here of the the ministry of presence and just being present with people and in lots of places that are not you know sexy and exciting and flashy you know we uh, we obviously get a lot of press about Wells Fest it's a great music festival lots of media attention uh, it's a great great event that that you know we've been doing for for many years now and and we'll continue to do it it's, it's part it's sort of part of our our fabric and our DNA and who we are but there are lots of little things like playing dominoes at a retirement home or some of our uh, parishioners who lead worship services at the, um, at the VA nursing home. And there, there are a lot of quiet places that Wells folk go. It's being a book buddy across the street with Galloway students. Um, you know, it's doing the Tuesday morning ministries with the food pantry. But there, there are lots of little places but 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 I wasn't really wrote down I just sort of thought that would be a pretty innocent way to get involved and I think that's one of the things that that we try to do here at Wells which um, one of the things we were talking about recently is that maybe we're almost too passive you know because we we want to be so respectful of people's space and, and a lot of people uh, who come here for healing do not need an over aggressive church trying to rope them in and get them on a committee or doing this. And so, so we really try to be respectful of people's uh, space. And, and in doing that, I think one of the things that we've realized, I think we need to do a little better is to provide some easier own ramps for people who are sitting on the, the sidelines or just sitting in that back pew, not to, to coerce them or to necessarily recruit them, but to make visible and clear to them, if you do want to be um, a part of some more of who we are here at Wells, here's how you could do that. And so we do some of that with the website and some things like that with social media, but but I think that's one of the things that we need to um, to work on a, a little bit better is to is to make it um, a little easier for people who who don't know, know know who we are because we continue to get uh, new folks through the doors. There was a young family that came uh, uh, over the last couple of months, and somebody and, and they were leaving the the service, and um, 
John Brazier, the associate pastor, said, well, we're glad you're here. And, and the father said something to the effect of, man, I wish I had known about y'all a long time ago. This is a great place. But it seems like in some ways Wells is people just find out about. It's not like you guys have a you know, blanket, everyone with brochures. or it, it, It's almost like this. it's a very word of mouth. Kind of just talking to all the different people and kind of the different how they found the place. It's very interesting. Though. Yeah, it is. And I think that um, it is. It's very personal. Um, it is. It's, I don't care where I go in the state. And this even happened to me out of state, too. When the subject, they say, well, where do you go to church? And I'll say, Wells Church. And I'll say, who's the pastor? And I'll say, Keith Tockle. I've heard about that place. I've heard about it. And so, so I think there's a, there's a real reputation out there, again, because I think people who, who come here have a, a wonderful experience. But it's a, I think it's a constant tension that we have in, um, because, I mean, mainline Protestant churches are in decline right now. I mean, all the demographic trends and things you look at. I mean, one of, there's a, I was just reading a review on a book I want to read that just came out as uh, The Death of White Christianity or something to that effect. Um, because things are changing a lot. And I think that all churches struggle with how do you maintain your identity and being faithful to what we're called to be as Christians but then you want other people to be a part of that and you want them to know about it, but you don't want to go and create this marketing, advertising campaign type thing. And so that, I think that's, that's something that, that we struggle with because a lot of people who come here are coming out of some bad experiences that they've had in organized religion or church. And so, again, we're trying to be, I think, mindful of that. But, um, but it's, it's threading that needle of, make, of being who we are, being um, committed to, to what we believe, you know, Christ has called us to be at this place at this time. And, and how do we do that? And how do we share that in a way that is um, this welcoming and is respectful? And it's faithful to the gospel all at the same time. It's a, it's a, it's a tough tension. Mm-hmm. What things after, so you did the dominoes, what other ministries have you been involved with over the years here? The, the main thing, I guess, over the, the years has been, uh, been a big part of Wells Fest. Um, I've, I'm the treasurer for, for that and sort of helping keep up with the money and all for, for that, and I've been doing that for, uh, for, for many, many years now. So that, that's one of the big things that I'm involved with. And I guess the other is on different committees of, of the church, whether it's we're on our personnel committee, our SPPRC, or, or finance committee, or the board, different, different things at different times. Um, I tell you the one that, that I'm, I'm really excited about is we've put together a little ad hoc committee that's looking at the, the renovation project that we want to do down in the fellowship hall. And, um, and it started out with a effort, well, we need to update the kitchen. Well, the kitchen's getting dated. It needs to be updated. And so, but it grew out of that. But the more we started realizing it, it's, it's way more than a kitchen renovation. This, because one of the things we want to do is we want to, uh, and we're working on what we're going to name it, but we want to name it in honor of Keith and Pat Tonkel and for their many, many years of service here and for, for their ministry. And so it's a, it's a recognition of their work. But I think more than, more than just that, uh, and, that's, and that's important, this is a time and a, a, a place where we as a congregation, I think, need to make a very strong statement and a, a commitment to, to this church and who we are, where we are. You know, we've, you know we're, we've chosen to stay right here on, on Bailey Avenue. And, um, 
and for lots of different reasons, good and bad, you know, other churches, many churches have left the city, but we, we've chosen to stay here. And again, as part of our fabric and our DNA and I think who we are, and when we started thinking about this and we said, well, we're celebrating our 90th birthday, what's the next 90 years going to be like? We're getting ready to turn 100 in 10 short years. And um, so I think this is going to be an opportunity for us to make a, a strong statement and investment that of who we are and that this that we want to make this all the, the special things that have happened at this place and in this place with people who are still here and who've come here, we want, to, we want to afford those same types of opportunities for people's faith journeys in the future. Um, again, I have no idea where my kids are going to live when they grow up, but if they choose to stay here, boy, wouldn't it be great if they had an opportunity to be a part of a congregation that is as, as committed, as diverse, and as committed to social justice as this one is, and so so that that's that's the one that we're we're working on real real hard now and figuring out what what that's going to to look like. But it's about it's about our future and the you know the white elephant in the room that has been now for many years is about Keith and what's going to happen post Wells once once Keith is no longer the the senior pastor and. Um, and that's a that's a real hard conversation for a lot of people because the vast majority of the people here have never known life without Keith Tonkel, which is real unusual. I, mean, I didn't grow up in the Methodist tradition, but it's real unusual <laughs> to have someone. Um, gosh, I guess he's going on what forty eight years or so of ministry here, and but we've we've got to find some ways to talk about that and and figuring out who we are, because as, as Keith's always said, this, this place is uh, far bigger than him and far bigger than Pat and, and all the many wonderful things that, that they have, they've brought here. We've got to figure out as a people the direction that, that we're going to go going forward because um, it'll be hard and it'll be a difficult transition, but it doesn't scare me as much as, uh, as some folks. And I, I don't know if that's um, rose-colored glasses or, or, or being naive, but, but I really think that Wells is going to continue to, to fill an, an, an important space here, not just for the, the people who go here, but for, I think, for the presence and, and what we represent within Jackson and the United Methodist Church. Talking about your renovation project and kind of the next 90 years, can you talk at all about like the discussions that, you know, I'm just thinking, of course you need things updated, but like what are things, well, maybe we could do this project or we could have this type of thing or we could expand this if we had this renovated space. I'm just curious about how it, how it might, how you might see it change the function of the church or the ministries of the church with that new space. Yeah, so I think a, I think a couple of things when you when we talk about the renovation project, and 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 Keith brought this up and, and we've started this conversation is that we've got to be very careful that um, you know a lot of times when you talk about renovations people want bigger, brighter, better type facilities, and and there's a lot of appeal to that, and obviously people want to make things nice, but again. Being who we are and where we are and what we represent, I think we've got to be very careful that we don't create a space that makes a lot of our community feel uncomfortable. You know, we have a, a large number of people, you know, close to 100 people every Tuesday morning who come here for part of our Tuesday morning ministries with the food pantry. And this, is, this needs to remain a space that they feel comfortable in and so I can tell you it's not going to involve uh, pristine architecture and stained glass so I think it's going to be something that'll be um, very I don't know other another adjective to use it's going to be real wells like it'll it'll be it'll be functional 
Um, but it's going to be a place where I think the wide um, cross-section of humanity that comes to this place for lots of different reasons, um, whether they're coming for uh, a James Club AA meeting, whether they're coming for Sunday school, Wednesday night worship, choir practice, food pantry, needing help getting an ID card, whatever brings people to this place, I think they're going to, when we're done, if we've done this right, and I'm confident we will, they'll say, this is my place too. And it's not just, you know, Keith, when he offers communion, um, I think this is just representative of what we're trying to do and who we are. He said, we view the table not as ours, but as Christ's table. And all are welcome and all are invited. And that's why we have, you know, on our sign out front, you know, where everyone is very welcome. Um, so while we don't know exactly what all this renovation is going to look like, I think that's going to be a hallmark signature of it is that it's going to continue to be a welcoming place. It's going to be one that that people um, are comfortable with. And it's one that says, there's a place for you here. And um, if you choose to come here, we, and we hope you do, there'll, there'll, be a, there'll be a space for you. A lot of people have talked about kind of the, the worship service itself and that, it, you know, it seems like he, Keith and other ministers try hard to kind of bring different elements in. So there's contemporary parts, there's traditional parts that be kind of, and that things are, it's not always the same thing Sunday after Sunday. There's always variety, and I, I guess that speaks to kind of having diverse. But I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that as a, you know, what you like about that, what are the things that really jump out at you that, that you like as far as the worship. Yeah, you know, when you've got as uh, as diverse a group as well, you've you've got to offer lots of different things to people to be able to connect to it. You know, one of the things that I think Keith does so beautifully is that he'll he'll weave in our faith tradition in such a way that people can understand it. A lot of times you'll go to a service and you'll just go through an order of worship and you're just doing you know, this series of activities. Well, usually each of those activities, be it prayer, be it the offertory, be it special music, whatever, is rooted in a very deep theological component about why are we doing this. Well, Keith, will, he'll explain that from time to time, and he'll, he'll, he'll talk about why we say the Apostles' Creed. And if that's something that you're comfortable with, please join us and participate in the, the recitation of this creed. If not, that's okay too. This is just part of our tradition and, and the way that we do it. Um, you know, one of the, the things that I think people find refreshing in his approach is that he, uh, he will acknowledge both the light and the dark of life and the reality that exists. Um, one of the most moving things that ever I experience at Wells is the baptism of a child. Um, my two children were baptized here at Wells. A very, it's a very personal thing because it's where we as a community of faith say we're going to help to raise this child and we're going to be a part of who you are. But you know, the, the thing that Keith always does without fail every time we baptize a child because as you can imagine for that family it is the height of hope and expectancy and joy to hold this this precious child but at the but as soon as the, the baptism is over Keith says something to the effect of while we celebrate with this family and this child we also pause to remember those who have lost a child or those who have never had the child of their heart's desire and you'd be amazed at how many people have lost a child or never had the child of their heart's desire 
and the way that he is able to weave in that part of our faith tradition and this celebration of baptism, but also acknowledging that for some, that's a very painful encounter. And we can talk about that. And again, that's okay. And we can do that in this space. It's a, it's a really holy and sacred type of um, encounter. And, and so he does that in different ways with the, the service. But, um, but that's one that has always been real important to me. And I think it, it speaks to, to his authenticity and to who we are. And that uh, when, you come to, when you come to Wells, you don't know what is necessary what you're going to get or what you're going to see. Um, but it's usually always going to be a good thing. might be an emotional thing, but, um, but it'll, it'll always be, it'll be a memorable experience, I think, for most folks who, who come here. Now, speaking of your children, I'm curious you to kind of think about, talk about, their experiences growing up in this church in terms of their the, um, the uh, Sunday school and, and how they've been kind of educated in their faith and maybe a little com- uh, comparing to your childhood and, and kind of how you, how you know, your Sunday school experience as a child. Right. Yeah, the... I am so thankful that my kids have been able to grow up here at Wells. Um, my two boys are 12 and 14 years old, and they've, they've, come, they've known no other church besides Wells. Um, and when I grew up, it was at a very large, very traditional Southern Baptist church where um, 99% of the folks were just like me. They were, they were Caucasian. They were white. Um, middle class, upper class, um, not a lot of not a, not a lot of poverty at all. Um, so it was a it was uh, a very homogeneous upbringing, and it, and I had a wonderful experience there. I gotta say, had a wonderful youth minister um, who helped cultivate my faith and helped me to to learn about who I was and what it meant to be a Christian and and how that. Um, how that plays out in life. I mean, it was a, it was a great experience uh, with my youth minister and her husband, Sue and Lee McAllister, wonderful, wonderful saints in Tupelo. But I'm so glad that my kids, when they come to church, they see, just like I was sort of describing earlier, they see a cross section of humanity. They come, they come in contact with people young and old that are very, different from them and very similar. Um, You know, it's interesting because where I grew up, we all went to school, the same school. You had a few different elementary schools, but everybody was at the same junior high, middle school, and everybody was at the same high school. You know, when we'll have a group of kids here, you know, if our youth group, if if they'll have on a given day, they might have 10 or 12 kids. Well, you're probably going to have nine or 10 different schools represented Um, You know, you're going to have people coming from all corners of the the metro area and right down the street. And I think that has been wonderful because my kids, they're able to see and have conversations about things here that just don't happen other places. And, um, and, And it's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing because they... They have they have a much keener sense of of social justice and about fairness and about what does it really mean to be uh, a Christian and how does that look in in action? I think because of their Wells experience than than I had because you don't a lot of times you have to go churches will go off to do mission work and to go out to do ministry and things well it's just it's part of who we are here you know and um and so so being able to for them to to see um 
the wonderful stuff that goes on here is has been a, a real gift for for my wife and I. What about um, other ministries, maybe that you've not been actively involved with that you have an interest in, you keep up with? Um, there just seems to be so many. It's it's kind of a little bit something for everybody. Yeah. Um, You know, I recently uh, retired, I sort of retired. I'm sort of in transition. I've, I've retired from, uh, from public education, and I just retired a couple of weeks ago from, from the Army Reserve. And so I'm, I'm trying to decide what my next, um, the next phase is going to be. And so one of the things I'm doing is, is dipping my toes into the water and looking at some different things that are going on here at the church because I'm probably going to gravitate to some, something in the nonprofit uh, area and there's a lot of neat things here that that go on go on at Wells. So 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 I've never been actively involved with the Tuesday morning ministries, but I want to start doing. So I came up this week and uh, you know helping with the food pantry and going to see you know how we help folks get their ID cards, which is again a seemingly simple thing that so many people take for granted, but. If you're out on the street and you don't have an ID, you've got problems in a major way. And you can't imagine the expressions of gratitude that folks have. One of the ladies that went with us Tuesday and she got her ID card, she said, I almost feel like I have my clothes on now because I'm finally getting some recognition of who I am and now I'll be able to go and do different things, whether it's register to vote or apply for a job or whatever but i mean she was just so excited that someone would help her to do something that our our bureaucratic systems can be pretty brutal at times and um and it's it's just one of the little things i mean that you don't get a lot of a lot of press out of but boy people will come up here for that they on tuesday mornings i say I hear you'll help folks get their ID cards and work with them. And so we'll help them with the paperwork, tell them what they need to do. Uh, the church will, you know, pay all the, the, the fees and things associated with it. But, um, but so, so that's, that's, that's one area. Um, we do a lot with Galloway elementary school across the street. So I, so I suspect I'm going to get uh, roped in to that a little bit with some uh, Catherine Dollar Hyde approached me today about doing some of that because she's been taking that on. So, so th- those are probably a couple of the, the areas of, of, of immediate interest I'm going to start doing. Well, you're a good one to ask because the, you're kind of going to be kind of surveying this all and seeing where you fit in in a new way, I guess. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talked about, um, I did a little article for our newsletter a few months ago and it was talking about, um, finances and church giving because because last year we had a little bit of a gap that we needed to close um financially and it, and it ended up sort of the way it always does miraculously it well things you know money follows purpose and and it all worked out at the end but one of the things that i talked about and it was a, a theme i'd picked up on on reading an article in life we have three things uh that we can uh invest we have our time we have our talent, and we have treasure. And for different people at different phases of their life, they've typically got more of one than the other. And so one of the things that we talked about with the congregation is that it's not just about giving your treasure. We would love to have your talent, and we'd love to have your time. Because, again, most people don't have an abundance of all three. And so I think it's important for us as a community of faith and and being authentic is saying, well, whatever you can invest, if it's time, if it's talent, if it's treasure, um, this is how you can. But again, we have to balance this, this, um, this whole notion because for a lot of folk, church experiences have been around um, tithing and giving has been a very awkward, difficult situation um you know i had a interesting uh encounter at a church that i went to up in washington dc uh when i was up there 
stationed with the army for a year. Wonderful congregation, wonderful pastor. But it was tie, it was a pledge Sunday. And for a lot of churches, you know, the, the pledge is a big deal. And so at this church, they wanted you to, they had pledge Sunday and everybody filled out their pledge card and it was this big thing. And at the end of the service, everyone got up and individually walked down and deposited the pledge card in the, in the offering plate. Well, I think I, I know I was, I was the only person who did not get up and walk down <laughs> and deposit the pledge card in the, the offering plate because that's not who I am now and that's not the faith tradition that that I'm I'm comfortable with and not to say what they're doing is wrong or bad but it's just not who I am and so when you talk about those types of things here we're really mindful to be respectful of folks who've had some some bad experiences there because it isn't just about the money and so, so if we can make a way for people to, to engage at the church um, with talent and with time, those are wonderful, precious gifts that I think a lot of people undervalue. And so, um, so I think as we, look at, as we look to the future and we'll, what are some things we're going to continue to do, I think we continue to make a, a, a place and a space where time and talent are absolutely just as embraced and, um, and, and recognized as, uh, as treasure. Mm-hmm. So are there, um, I mean, you've talked a lot about kind of the future and I'm just curious, is that, is that a discussion that's happening amongst members of the church in, a, in an ongoing way or is it just something that's, I mean, some people obviously talking to them have, like you said, been more comfortable talking about other people are like, I just don't, I don't want to think about it. So <laughs> the reaction some people and others, they're, you know, they've been puzzling about it. Right. It seems to be on everybody's mind. So I'm just cu- curious about how openly it, it is talked about. Yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of one-off conversations right now. So I think that people in their own spaces are beginning to, to talk about it. Um, but it's still an awkward conversation. I think people view it as awkward because they maybe they think that it's being uh, disrespectful of Keith, or maybe it's that well, we don't want this to be interpreted that we're trying to, to force him out. And, um, and and that's clearly not the case. And I think <laughs> clearly Keith is secure enough in his his own skin to to know his role here. And, uh, and he knows that at some point there's going to be a Wells without Keith Tonko as a senior pastor. And so, so I think one of, the, um, one of the greatest gifts that we could probably give to Keith is in helping to create a transition in such a way that Wells will continue to be Wells. And it will continue to be this wonderful place that's going to be going for for decades more and in, in modeling the leadership that that he has uh, he has given to us for for so many years. So it's, it it hasn't begun in a, a formal way, but but I think we really need need to do that. Um, again, I, it, you know, it sort of sounds um, some 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 phrases I'm using over and over, but it's again it's threading a needle here. It's a it's. Because a lot of people have come from churches where there have been uh, tough experiences with pastors, going, coming, staying, and um, and so while we, I think while a large portion of the congregation realize we need to begin to have these these discussions and these conversations, um, you want to do it in a Wells like way. You want to do it in a way that's respectful and. You don't want to over organize. You know, or- Wells is sort of um, anti organizational. <laughs> you know, if if something starts getting too organized, it doesn't quite have the spirit of the spontaneity and creativity that, that we like to to associate ourselves with. And so um, so anytime we start to feel like we're getting too organized, we start to say, "Oh, it's starting to sound a little a little Baptist here." Or what? <laughs> you know, we got we're creating another committee. We got to be careful. 
Um, but it's it's a uh, it's a conversation that we're we're gonna gonna have to have. But it's one that I hope that people will come into with a with an attitude of expectancy and hope and excitement more so than the uh, wailing and fear and trembling and trepidation that that I think most people are are naturally inclined to to do when they when they think about wells without Keith. Well, I think we've covered a lot of good stuff today. Are, is, are there things that you wanted to make sure and, or talk about or mention that have come up that you've been thinking about before we shut down the recorder? No, like, well, this will be, if I don't have a chance to, to talk with Sarah <laughs> about this later, but I think this is a very important work. I'm so appreciative that uh, time is being taken to capture these stories and to document um this part of the history of Wales. Um, I'm really excited to, to learn how this is going to be made accessible to, to folks. I, I come out of uh, education background and a lot with uh, testing and assessment and accountability, and we use the phrase often that we are data rich and information poor. We've got tons and tons of data, but nobody has really translated it into accessible actionable information. So so I'm just hopeful that we can take um, some of these narratives and some of these stories in ways that sounds like you've done in lots of places, but make them accessible and, and make them part of um, of a of a history that people can can connect with. I mean I'm I'm looking forward to as this thing rolls out it's at some point with my two boys saying, hey Let's go listen to this interview with Aunt Betty or with Keith or, or, or you know, a number of the pilgrims here. But, but that's the thing that, that I uh, am most excited about is being able to, to share, share in this and, and share it with others. Because, again, most people have heard about Wells. And to really get a sense of what this place is, there's, there's no better way than the narrative of a story and so um so thank you for for what you're doing and for being a part of this and all the other things that you've done thanks a lot i appreciate it all right thank you very much appreciate it